so I'm John Harmon. Um, I run the R4DS online learning community. I have met some of you. Um, I'm going to keep looking over to the side while I'm talking. So if you see my video and are confused by that, uh, that's where you all are showing up for me. So um, that's what's going on there. And hopefully I'll be able to pay attention to the chat. But if there's a question that I'm not answering, someone speak up and let me know, please. Um, so yeah, this is the uh, first meeting of the R4DS Project Club. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit of an introduction to what the heck the idea is. And then I'm going to present this package that I created, um, Shiny Slack, and uh, some just some stuff around that. Um, you can follow along at r4ds.io slash proj0101. Um, that is, this is my first like Quarto uh, Reveal JS presentation. And so it's set up that in theory, uh, as I go through the slides, that if you're like, watching it there, it'll advance you through the slides. Um, so you can use that if you wanna, you know, if you can't see it very well on your device or whatever, you can um, follow along that way. All right. So let's start with an introduction to what the heck this club is. All right, so the schedule for this um, is we're gonna meet monthly. Uh, we'll meet on the second Saturday of every month. So that means the next meeting is November 12th. Uh, and I think I think Connor is signed up. Um, someone signed up for November 12th. And so- Yeah, I think that's me. Yeah, all right. Um, the meetings will be about an hour, I say or less. Technically, we do have a little bit of wiggle room here that we could, uh, you know, stretch a little long if something, if there's an interesting conversation going or something, but aim for about an hour. And we do have a sign up sheet. Like I said, that Connor has signed up for next week and we have, or next month rather. Um, we have a number of signups, but not like indefinitely into the future. That is pinned in the project general channel on Slack. Um, just a, an, about that, the name of the channel might change because I don't know, people are having trouble finding it. So I'll see if I, uh, you know, look for project something, project club, project general. We're going to see how, what people come up with, but um, that channel will might be renamed. Um, but this link, actually, yeah, this is a link. So that link will still work, even if I rename the channel. And um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you might not be in the R4DS Slack. So r4ds.io slash join to join our um, Slack. And I just realized I skipped over a slide somehow. Here we go, okay. Uh, and before I start too much, I do wanna mention that R4DS has a code of conduct. Uh, you can find it at r4ds.io slash conduct. The general idea is we want to make an open and welcoming environment. Uh, we want it to be harassment free, a harassment free experience for everyone. If you ever have a problem in um, this club, one of our book clubs or with Slack, you can contact us at r4datasci at gmail.com or just ping me at John the Geek on the Slack um, and we will take care of that. The community is great. I have almost never had to do anything about this, um, which is amazing, but please let me know if you have anything that is not living up to our standards. Um, and the point on that is if, uh, or it, not the point, I mean, the point of that is the code of conduct, but why I remembered that it was missing is if you're trying to join and r4ds.io slash join doesn't work, you can email r4datasci at gmail.com and we will fix that. That is supposed to be a perpetual signup link according to Slack, but every once in a while it just randomly expires. Um, so I don't think they know what perpetual means. All right, so what is this club? Um, the idea is to give everyone some practice or allow, allow everyone to have some practice presenting about something that you like care about. Uh, not quite the same thing as with book clubs. Like you might be kind of excited by a chapter, but it's not your work. And so we, I wanted to let people uh, present and actually practice real, you know, something closer to a real presentation. Um, since these will be recorded, that also means that if you speak, you could include a link to that if you're applying to speak at a conference. A lot of times they want to see uh, a talk you've given. So this gives you something to use for that. Um, it's also like another purpose is 
to allow, like, I am going to be working today to try to recruit contributors. Uh, find pe if any of you are interested in the package that I'm gonna, pre gonna present, you, you are very welcome to come to GitHub and uh, help me out with that. And so that might be something that you wanna do with your presentation. You might want to just show a thing that you think is cool. Um, some open source project you're working on, um, a technique that you think is neat, uh, whatever it might be, it's kind of the same idea as what you would might do at a conference, um, except with lots of room to take as long or as short of a time as you want, basically. And uh, I just, I love this quote, uh, Colin Burke put this into the R Packages Book Club slides, and I want to put it in like all of my slides now for all of the R4DS stuff, because the idea is that none of us is as smart as all of us. There is something that uh, I don't know that one of you knows, or many of you know, there are many things probably, um, we can help each other out. And so by meeting and sharing these things uh, and discussing them, we can all learn. Uh, so what's the format? Um, well, today, you know, as you can see, it could be a slide deck. Uh, you could do some live coding maybe, or just, you know, showing the code in our studio or VS code or whatever. Maybe it would just be a Q and A if you're presenting something uh, that people like generally know about already and you just want to kind of dive in, maybe something else. So the idea here is whatever makes sense to you for a presentation, uh, we're open to give it a try, you know, within reason. Um, today, I have a slide deck. I might do some live coding. We'll see where things go by the end. I actually have two Q&As uh, for the two halves of the talk. And then I don't think I'll do anything else, but um, Maybe, we'll see. And so on that note, uh, first Q&A, does anyone have any questions about the schedule, uh, what we're doing, the purpose, the format, anything else about the club? And I will watch the chat if anyone has anything. Questions, okay. Yes. Nope, oh, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, so like in the book club is how we like compile notes. Mm -hmm. I know, well, I realize we'll have the videos for this. Are we gonna, like put any sort of anything on GitHub? Um, so far, my plan is no, because it's so wide open of what people might present. Um, but I might change about that. Um, which, what answer were you hoping for, <laughs> I guess? Oh, just curious, yeah. <laughs> um, I like the idea of shared notes, but because these are so, wide ranging, it doesn't make as much sense as it does for the book clubs, I don't think. Um, for example, packages that I use in my presentation, um, others are unlikely to want to use in their presentation. Um, so I don't think it's as coherent of a thing, but we'll see. I um, We do have an account at uh, Cordo.pub for R4DS, as you can see if you are following along with the notes. Um, so maybe, um, but right now, no. <laughs> so now we'll get into uh, the thing I wanted to talk to you about, this Shiny Slack. It's a package for connecting Slack teams to Shiny apps. Uh, I'm very proud of this hex sticker. I have to get these printed and hand them out at the next conference I go to. I really like how they came out. Uh, that is the Slack logo in neon, so it's Shiny Slack. Um, but yeah, so this package came about because, uh, you know, we have the book clubs, we have uh, a mentor dashboard for R4DS, and I wanted a way to hook what we do uh, in the, the Slack side of R4DS up to whatever else we might do in Shiny. Um, and so let's see what that is. So I did have a lightning talk about this at our studio account this summer. Uh, that video is at r4ds.io slash rstudio 2022 v. If you leave off the v, it's the slide deck. Um, the talk I gave was focused on like um, how to use it and kind of the motivation behind it, which I didn't, you know, if you're here, uh, some of you probably have used the Book Clubber uh, app and logged in and seen that it it logs who you are and we use that to, to see or to keep track of things that way. Um, today I'm gonna focus on the underlying code, but 
I'm also going to talk about most of what I said at the other talk because I've got an hour instead of five minutes. Um, but yeah, the video is embedded, or actually it's linked from the uh, these slides. So if you go to rds.io slash proj 0101, or you can go to the link that's showing here. All right, so the, the general idea is that I wanted to add a sign in with Slack button to uh, Shiny apps. And I wanted to be able to do it without having to, uh, like signing in is complicated. And I didn't want to have to deal with that every time I made a new app. I wanted to just make it easy um, and then theoretically make it easy for other people using other Slacks. Uh, so if you want to do this, or if you want to use this, uh, you can install it using the remotes package. Uh, install GitHub r4ds slash shiny Slack. That's where the app is on GitHub. Um, and this is my first like question that uh, I would love to get an answer to either on the Slack or live right now. You have to tell it to build the vignettes when you install it. And the, there are useful vignettes in this. I don't know, like I swear that it, I've seen other packages that I install from GitHub that the, the vignettes come along for the ride and I don't know why mine don't. So if anyone knows how to make that happen by default, uh, for, you know, like, do I have to, what do I have to do on my repo? Um, I don't know. That is something that one of these days I need to just dig in and find the answer if no one knows it already, uh, because it's annoying to me. I write vignettes, uh, sorry, a vignette, if you're not familiar, is when you, uh, in the package documentation, there's the like description at the top. And then there, sometimes there's a row below that, that is like, um, I don't remember the wording and I'm going to load this up real quick if I can. But it is the, uh, it's the, oh, of course, the place that I'm looking, I don't have it installed uh, with the vignettes. Um, it's like usage guides, where is it? User guides, package vignettes, and other documentation. So it's a way that you can write documentation that isn't just linked to one function. It's linked to like whatever you want. It's, it's linked to the package. Um, for example, I have a vignette in Shiny Slack about uh, how to get set up, how to find your team code, how to find all the info that you need in order to use it, which we'll see uh, in a minute. Um, those vignettes are really useful and I wish that I could make them build by default. So um, hopefully someone will have an answer for that. I think, I mean, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's possible to make that just automatic. All right, so to use it, um, we're comparing to, uh, if you're using Shiny, like a normal app, you can use the Shiny app command from Shiny to launch your app with, uh, you give it a UI and you give it a server and you can optionally give it some more commands. With Shiny Slack, we just change to from Shiny app to Shiny Slack app, still give it the UI and the server, and we have to give it a team ID and a site URL. Um, and as you can see, there's a number 25 next to that. And there's this link down here. And hopefully, um, yes, I, I hope that you see that I, I loaded this uh, URL. This is one of many issues that I have that I would love help with. Um, I mean, this one, I think I've got it figured out, but I've got it, you know, I've got to take the time to do it. And so if anyone wants to participate to help, you can come to github.com slash r4ds slash shiny slack and uh, hopefully uh, help me out with that. We'll see some more tags for 25 as we go and we'll also see some other tags for other issues. Uh, so anyway, it, right now you have to tell me where your app is deployed and I hate that and I think I haven't figured out how to make, make it so that I don't need you to tell me that. Um, that is important because when you try to log in, you have to tell the login server uh, where to send people back to basically. And then the login server checks that that is legal. Um, and I don't like that should be automatic. It's where where your app is. Um, so anyway, hopefully that'll be, that fix will be coming soon. So, okay, yeah, this is a demo of how it works. Um, <laughs> this is UI. So one thing that you need, if you're gonna, well, no, if you're going to use info from Slack, you need to include this JavaScript for working with cookies. There is no package on 
crayon that I can find that has all of the cookie stuff for Shiny, which just blows my mind because it's really useful. There is a uh, repo that is owned by someone who, as far as I know, is still an R Studio employee called Shiny Cookie or Shiny Cookies um, that appears to be abandoned. There's a repo by uh, Colin Fay out of uh, Thinkar, France, who does a lot of Shiny stuff. He has a repo called uh, Gluton um, or Gluten. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it. It's like the French word for Gluten, I think. Um, that one also handles cookies and is not on Pran. And he uh, actually prefers that people use a different package. He doesn't think there should be a package that handles cookies. I think there should. So right now I put it all in this package called scenes that I have, that it has a whole section that is, these are functions that should be in their own package, but I don't haven't had time yet to make that package. Um, so that's a whole separate project that I wanna make a package that handles cookies. Right now I've got a few functions that handle most things about cookies. And that's what this is doing. This is just adding to a UI, uh, the stuff that's needed to deal with cookies. Um, and then my UI is just super, super simple. It's a fl you know fluid page, but it only has one thing on it, which is a text output of a username. If you're not familiar with Shiny, that's fine, but uh, just know that this is going to find a variable named username, or, or it's it's creating a, um, a, a div, a, a place on the page named username, basically, that the server can fill in with some sort of text. So that's uh, that's the UI. The server has these functions is logged in. This is using, or sorry, it has uh, the object is logged in, which is created using the check login function from Shiny Slack. That just takes the input and the team ID um, and returns a reactive, uh, a Shiny reactive that will be either true or false. It'll be true if you're logged in, false if you're not. Uh, also, I have a username reactive that take, uses this user info function and that uh, you can get various components, but here we just want the username component. And then I take that, uh, or I, I set the output username using render text. Uh, if they are logged in, so that's what the shiny rec means, it will display the username. Um, that's the whole thing. That's, that's you know my little silly test app. Um, and then we launch it with Shiny Slack app, UI equals UI, server to server. I give it the team ID, which I also had above this uh, team ID. There, like I said, there's a vignette on how to find it. If you load a uh, Slack, uh, like if you launch a Slack message in a browser, this ID is there. Or if you um, like si go to the page uh, to sign up to like um, pay for Slack, It'll give you the the URL or the team ID there. Um, obviously, you, this is the one for R4DS. So if you're making something that deals with R4DS, that's the team ID. Um, and then again, I have to give it this team ID or team site URL, which hopefully I won't have to give it soon. And just to see what this does, I'll actually launch the app. Um, and so this is R4DS community.shinyapps.io slash shiny slack. Um, this UI is uh, not great. And there is an issue in the repo about, hey, help someone who is um, a designer help me make this not so bad, uh, but it gets the job done. So when we first come here, here we have this sign in with a Slack button, click that. It's gonna ask me if it's okay. And I say, yes. And then it comes back and now it actually loads my app, which again, my app is just print my name. Um, if you're watching this and you go to the URL and you log into our Slack, uh, it should show your name. Now that username is like the name you gave Slack when you first signed up and it doesn't always show up anywhere anymore, um, but it will give you a name. It will give you the name that Slack knows you by basically, uh, that our Slack knows you by. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and delete that cookie. So if I because we're gonna we're gonna look at that more uh, as we go. So let's go back to there we go. Okay. So uh, how does that work? The 
the the like inspiration to make this package was when I found out that UIs can be functions in Shiny. Um, when you make a normal UI, like if we go back uh, here, you know, this is the result of a function, but it isn't itself a function. It's uh, just a list of HTML um, and JavaScript and style sheet info. Um, but it can be a function. Uh, I learned that from the package Gollum that they their um, Gollum is a package for creating Shiny apps as packages. Uh, it's on CRAN. It's put out by Thinkar France. Um, and yeah, they they like suggest they guide you to make your UI as a function. And I was like, oh, that's neat. And so that led to one of my favorite techniques for learning. Um, how to do things in R is if you hit F2 when you're in R Studio, if you're on the name of a function, it shows you the definition of that function. And you can like follow that trail and keep going and find the definitions of different functions. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to simulate that here. So I went to Shiny, Shiny app. I was like, oh, um, Shiny app takes the UI. What does it do with that UI? And so, it, you know, put my cursor in the word Shiny app and hit F2, and it loads this function, which is a pretty um, kind of scary looking function. But the part that's important is that there's this UI HTTP handler function that takes the UI and then nothing below here uses UI directly. It's just using this thing. So it's like, okay, what, it, what does it do? How does it deal with the difference between it being a function or a uh, list of HTML basically? And so, um, sorry. And so, you know, put my cursor there, hit F2, and that gives me this other function, which is um, bigger and scarier. But the part that we care about is it says, oh, if it's a function, if the, if the UI is a function and it has an argument, that's what this length formals UI means. If it has at least one argument, uh, just send the request through that function and then use that. That's that's really all that's happening here. The request is the thing that your browser sends to the server to say, hey, give me this web page. It includes the URL that you use to hit it. Um, if you have any, like all of this stuff about the, uh, the um, you know, the rest of the URL basically. Um, it includes uh, any cookies that, this page has access to on your server or on your um, in your browser. It includes info about like what languages uh, your system supports. It includes um, what browser you're using, things like that. And so, Shiny is sending that request into the UI function if it has an argument. If it doesn't have any arguments, it uh, just calls the function to get its uh, you know, to get its output. And then if it's otherwise, if it's not a function, it just uses it directly. And I saw that and I was like, well, okay, if I had a function that, uh, you know, if I want to like use the request, if I want to use cookies, if I want to use uh, things in the query and or in the, you know, in the URL, uh, I can just have a UI function and then I do things with the request and then I return whatever the other UI function was. Maybe I, I do this part uh, for you. So since uh, Shiny thinks that it's already been processed, but Shiny doesn't like care. Shiny really just wants the output. It wants the thing at the end that the function generates. So that led to like everything else I'm gonna talk about today. <laughs> All right, so, um, I'm gonna go back here. So again, Shiny Slack app is the meat of how Shiny Slack works. So this Shiny Slack app function, let's go, let's see how that works. But before I do that, oops. Does anyone have any questions about so far? Any comments, anything? Uh, I will stop. So Novica, is it, is it Novica? Is, I, I feel like the accent has to be wrong on, on that, but uh, he said you should, read, sorry, what? It's close enough. Okay. <laughs> um, you said that I should register the repo for Hacktoberfest. Um, I don't know anything about that. So what does that mean <laughs> to register a repo for Hacktoberfest? It's just, Hacktoberfest is this like online event happens every October. 
where people make contributions to open source projects uh, and they get some kind of rewards for that. Uh, it's organized by several, several companies, I think. Um, okay. So if you have issues that are uh, so beginner level issues, uh, people who are learning that can contribute and they're labeled with um, a tag Hacktoberfest or I, mean, I, know, I don't know the exact tag for this year. Okay. But, uh, but you can check, like we can check, I can check for you if you want to. Um, then when people make the pull requests, um, they get the rewards. So it's, it's like a win-win for everybody. Yeah. Uh, you get some issues resolved. Uh, some people get their uh, sort of uh, credentials for, for winning an award and it's, it's good. Cool. I will definitely look into that. I, um, I've heard of it, but I've never like, it's never really registered uh to me of what it is so um cool i'm sure that we have things that could people could play with um all right so this is this is the the main function of this pack well this is the first function um my documentation on these is not great right now but i um i wanted to show you what i have uh anything here i don't know how many of you have written in our package but if you see this um the hashtag apostrophe, that means that it is documentation. It's telling this the package Roxygen2, this is the documentation for the function that it's above. Uh, here, this is like the little like title uh, that shows for the documentation. This is the first paragraph that shows in the documentation, and this will be a link over to Shiny app in Shiny. Um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is that when I am writing a package, I am a big fan of inherit params. What that'll do is it loads the definition of uh, any parameters that my function has in common with this other one that's somewhere else in the package, or it can even be one that's in a different package. I like to do that because then if I like change my mind about how to word something, I only have to change it in one place. Um, and also because then the way I describe something is the same in every function that uses that same argument. Uh, the, there are exceptions, like let's say I have some special usage of UI in this function, then I can just still just define at param UI and give it a unique definition for this function, even though I'm inheriting from the other ones. Um, so that's just something I want to point out on here. And then I also take the dots and I just say that that uh, gets passed on to shiny app. Uh, this is going to return an object that represents the app. It's the, the thing that Shiny app would return that when you print it, it launches uh, the Shiny app and it's exported. That's the at export uh, tells Roxygen. And exported just means it's like actually available in the package uh, without doing any tricksy hackery. Um, and so, yeah, it's this function. It takes a UI, a server, team ID, site URL for now. Hopefully we get rid of that. Uh, and the uh, expiration, which is the expiration of the cookie that we're going to be setting. Um, and then also anything else that you want to pass on to Shiny App. Um, so there's a question in the chat, is inherit params only something for Roxygen docs? How do people manage the same functionality in regular code? Uh, it is only for Roxygen docs. And to be clear, what you are inheriting is the help doc for that parameter. So you're inheriting the description that shows up uh, when someone looks at the help for the function. And so I don't think they're like, I'm not sure what it would mean to do the same functionality in regular code. Because um, in this case, it specifically means documentation is inherited from the other documentation. Did that answer your question? And we'll watch for um, an answer. Almost, oh, but I will type up a follow up. Okay. <laughs> so I might have more to say on that in a moment. Um, while he's typing. Uh, so what I'm doing here, like I'm not going to dig into every little piece of what's happening, but I capture those dots that anyone might have passed in using this function list two from Arlang. Um, that just lets you, it, it handles all the weird tidyverse or tidy, tidy eval 
stuff, uh, but it's basically just making a list that has the dots. Um, and then I'm taking the op any options that got passed in in dots and the site URL, which hopefully I'll just do the option soon. And I pass it through this thing that all this does is if it's interactive, it sets it up to load locally. If it's not interactive, it deals with um, anything that's in the query part of the parameters, anything that's after the after a question mark. Um, and then after I parse that, I take, and if you passed in options, I get rid of it. Set that to null because now those options are in this parsed object. So, so to follow up on the question from before, it's, for example, function one is uh, function my long list of params. Function two gets function new params, comma, dot, 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 comma, inherit params function one. No, uh, that isn't what this does. You still have to tell it what params uh, are in our arguments to your actual function. Um, I think there might be some code that deals with that, but I don't, I've never done that. So if you are defining a function, you still have to list all the arguments to that function. Um, I think it's dangerous not to, because if you're gonna directly use the arguments from another function, then you wanna know what they are. And if you're not gonna directly use them, they can just be dots. You don't have to do anything special to inherit them. You can use this dot, dot, dot construct in R. And that just means anything else that they send in. And then normally, if you're not doing these weird things, uh, right. And so yeah, Gus points out that you can use dot, dot, dot to access the extra arguments. In a normal case where I'm not modifying what they sent, pass in in dot, 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 you would just pass dot, dot, dot through to uh, the next function. And so that's a, a you know, like function one, might take dot, 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 or sorry, function two would take dot, dot, dot as an argument, and it would just pass dot, dot, dot through to function one uh, directly. So it, I'll type that in chat that it would be, you know, function two might have punct one and like literally just do that where it's got dot, dot, dot as the arguments that you pass to punct one, and then that passes through. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome, very welcome. All right, um, so now, yeah, I've got my parsed arguments uh, that I care about. I've got the dots cleared out or the options cleared out of the dots. And then, uh, yeah, sorry, I wanted to point that out. And then I do this rlang exec, which is um, call this function. So the first argument is the function to call, which is shiny, uh, shiny app. And I want you to call it with the UI will be my fancy Slack shiny UI that takes the UI and does something to it. Um, with this parsed uh, site URL and the expiration that they passed in. Uh, server just passes straight through as the server. The options are the options that I've pulled out plus some things that I've added onto the options. And then this weird thing here, uh, bang, 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 dots is how, uh, how you pronounce that. Bang, bang, bang is a Arlang thing. Um, Arlang is like the package behind all of the tidyverse code. Um, and oh, big bang, I hadn't heard. Okay, that also works, but bang, bang, bang. Um, I, I think of it as, so it's three exclamation points, just like three, the three dots. And what it does is it takes whatever's after it and turns it into dots. Like it expands it out into multiple arguments. Um, and so that's what's happening here is it takes, I'm taking the dots and I'm expanding it back out from a list into separate arguments. Um, and again, I got the link to number 25 to get rid of this uh, site URL that we keep having to pass around. Um, yeah, there's bang, bang and bang, bang, bang. Um, the bang, bang is used for one argument to like make it the, uh, to, to, like deal with anything that's passed into a function. We aren't gonna be using that. And this is the only place that I use bang, 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 I think in this whole package. Um, and again, bang, bang, bang is just to expand a list out into separate arguments. All right. Now though, so this Slack shiny UI, this is really the meat of my package. So let's, let's see what, how that works. So, all right, Slack shiny UI, uh, this is the function 
that it's a function factory, which means it takes uh, takes some arguments and it returns a function. Um, and the function that it returns wraps around a shiny UI uh, to to you know make it uh, have all the login info. If they don't have a cookie for that site, they are prompted to log in. Once they have a cookie, the UI displays as normal. And I've got this number five here. Uh, number five is uh, GDPR, et cetera, that uh, technically I shouldn't require that people use cookies. I should allow you to log in without cookies. Um, and so there are going to be these number five decorations that are, here's all the places that uh, touch this issue. Um, and so again, if anyone wants to help with that, uh, I've got parts of it figured out, but I don't have this one as completely like pre-solved as number 25 is. I just need 25. I just need time to do it. Or someone to take the time to do it. Five, there's some more figuring things out left to do. So here I inherit params from, uh, this is something that I did in this package. And I think I started doing it in a couple other packages since then that I have an object at the like front of my package that it's just a Roxygen block and then null. And that lets me, and it, it has at name dot shared hyphen parameters. And that lets me put a bunch of parameter definitions into one place. And I don't have to remember which function they're defined in because throughout this package, I've got UI, team ID, site URL in lots of different functions. And I didn't want to have to keep like, I didn't want to end up with a circular reference of uh, inherit params basically. So I have this one dot shared parameters and that's where I define a, a bunch of things. Um, I don't think I've seen anyone do that. So uh, I think I made up that idea. Um, and then I also inherit parameters from this parse auth code function that I'm gonna call. Generally what I do is in a function, if I call a function I in, and pass a parameter through to it, I inherit from that. Um, and otherwise, you know, define all the parameters separately, except in this case, it's, I'm using all these reused ones. Um, I'm going to return a function that defines the UI of a Shiny app, either with login or without, and I'm going to export this. Um, as we've seen, this function takes UI team ID, site URL, and an expiration. All right, and now we're going to get into the craziness of how this package actually works. So um, what I want to do is I want to set up different cases of um, what should the UI be in different cases. So the first case is if you already have a cookie, a, a token for Slack uh, in your in a cookie, I'm gonna use this other package that I'm not gonna go into how it works today probably, but I'm gonna talk a, a fair amount about, um, about it. And actually I just saw the time, so we'll see how much I talk about it. But so this package scenes is some, one that I've almost finished. Uh, it's I finished it enough to work for Shiny Slack. And the idea is it takes a UI, and a condition. So here, or one or more conditions, zero or more conditions, actually. Um, this is the condition of the request has a cookie, and that cookie has to have this name that I generate from the team ID, and it has to, uh, this validate function uh, that's in Shiny Slack has to return true. Um, and then team ID gets passed into the validation function. Um, and so the idea is if they have a cookie that has the name of, you know, shiny slack underscore name of the team, something like that. I can't remember exactly what I named the cookie. Um, it will take that cookie, take the value of that cookie, pass it through this validate cookie token function that I have. And if that function, basically that function does a super simple query to slack and says, hey, is this, is this token valid to, to do that query? If so, it returns true. Otherwise it returns false. Um, and if it is true, so if this thing is true, this UI will get chosen by uh, another scenes function coming up. Did that at least kind of make sense? <laughs> I know that's a weird concept, especially if you're not like a big um, shiny nut already. But, all right, I've got a thumbs up, so I'm gonna move on. So that's first case that they have the cookie. We display the UI and here we're just, we're displaying the UI that you passed in. So if you already have the cookie, you're already logged in. And if the cookie is valid, good. All right, we'll display the UI that you want to display. 
Next one, I, I call out that um, if we're letting it work without cookies, that still should work. So there should be a version that deals with that uh, once we implement the cookie free version. All right, the third or the, the second main case is they're returning from the OAuth endpoint. So this is, OAuth is like a system of uh, authentication. It's used by Google, I think it's used by Facebook, it's used by Slack. Uh, and like, I swear every guide to how to use OAuth is aimed at people who already know how to use OAuth and it drives me crazy. Um, it's really hard to learn how to use OAuth from scratch. Um, but I, I'm mostly there. I mostly understand it now. And OAuth does this thing where you um, send uh, some info to a URL and tell it where to go back to. That URL, if that info is valid, sends a code back to the original URL. Um, and then that original URL can exchange that code for the token, the actual thing that tells uh, whatever it is that's asking for permission. Uh, it's the token is the thing that that thing actually uses. Um, so it's this like multi-step dance and it's making sure that the site that you're trying to use, um, you have access to and that that is allowed by the endpoint as a, a legal valid place, which is why I need the site URL everywhere. Um, Cause I need to pass that through so that OAuth can say, is it, um, is that valid? So that's what's happening here. We're gonna go, the theory, we're gonna go into this code a little bit more, but that's the general idea. Uh, so I, I am generating a UI, or a UI with this parse auth code uh, function. And I, show, I send that UI back to the user. If the request has query, that's um, like if I did uh, code equals blah. So the question mark code equals blah is the query section of the URL of the request. If the if there's a query that has that is named code, I do this uh, UI. And again, we'll go into that function a little bit to see what it does. But it 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 will deal with is the code valid basically. So that's the next UI. And then the final UI, uh, the default. See, it doesn't have any uh, requirements on it. It's the fall through. If they don't have a cookie, they don't have a code then I have to give them the login UI. And the login UI is, uh, well, that went to sleep, but it's it's this one, it's the this. So that function generates this, um, it generates the URL that we link to, and we're gonna look at that in just a second. Um, and yeah, it uses the site URL and the team ID to generate it. Soon it will just use the team ID uh, to generate it. Um, all right, and then the last piece is the other main function from scenes is this change scene. And that is the thing that takes all these separate scenes and decides which one is valid for a certain situation. Um, it takes them in order. So if has cookie token, um, like if it's uh, uh, requirements are true, then it ignores the next two. If it's not true, then it goes to the next one. And then it, finally it goes to this one. Um, but yeah, that's the idea. It's deciding what to show. And that, so what it's returning is a function that takes request as a parameter. And then it uses that request to send it into like the next piece to, to decide what to show. So it's making this like multi-step uh, function that is just passing that request object through to decide what to do. Is this mostly making sense? Does anyone have any questions? All right, I'm gonna try to get through everything. It was much faster when I was uh, just reading it uh, without an audience. So, um, all right, so we're gonna dig into this case three, the do login. Oh, um, something to point out on these. This is, it's a style thing that we adopted at work that I like, and again, like no one else does it, but um, I find it easier to navigate my code this way, that anything that's not exported, we put a dot on the front, um, that it just like, it helps us keep track of, is this something that we plan to have other users touching or not? Um, it's also useful when you're exploring, like when I'm exploring one of my coworkers code, uh, I can quickly see 
uh, like if I type shiny slack colon colon colon, that lets you see what both of the or both the exported functions and the unexported functions. And I know that all the ones that start with dot are unexported. All the ones that don't start with dot are exported. So it's just um, a thing we do to keep track of things. It also means that uh, if we are looking at the documentation for the package and we see something that has a dot in it, it means we screwed up. So it helps us uh, like identify things like that. We actually, we got that from the Google R style guide. So the people who code in R at Google, uh, that was a rule that they set and we quite like that. So um, you'll see that uh, throughout this. Um, other than that, we just use the tidyverse style guide, but the the dot do well. No, there are still a, there are a couple other things that I do that are weird. Um, one of those being, I also like to explicitly return. You don't need to say return in R, like the thing that you print at the end or that you you know that you say at the end is returned. But uh, we are explicit about it. Just if you're in a bunch of ifs or whatever, it it makes it clear. Oh, right, that's the thing that we're returning. It also kind of forces us to go, oh, oops, like, you know, if I had an assignment here, it wouldn't actually return the thing correctly. And so uh, it makes me realize, oh yeah, this is the thing I'm returning. So again, uh, those are the two weird things you will see throughout my code. All right, so let's go look at what does do login do. So this is the function that actually, you know, like I said, it generates this, this UI that has the login button. Um, it takes the site URL and the TMID. Uh, it is a function factory and just an idiosyncrasy of function factories, which uh, the advanced R book goes into in detail. And this is a link to the advanced R cohort one where I uh, did the book club about function factories. One way to create function factories is you can just kind of use um, use these arguments that are coming in, but it's dangerous because those arguments could change before the function gets called because the way R is kind of lazy about func um, arguments. And so if you force them, it like locks them in to the values that you think they are. It's basically what's going on there. You'll see that again through all of these because we're creating lots of function factory or but most of these functions are function factories that return functions. Uh, if that didn't make sense, that's okay. Go watch the function factories video or go read advanced R. Um, it's weird and complicated and function factories are crazy, but I like function factories a lot because they let you do all kinds of crazy fun things. Um, separately, I actually have a package on CRAN called factory that is all about making function factories, um, but it is it generates code for you to then use in packages. So it doesn't show up anywhere in here. All right. So the first thing we need to do is get an off, uh, authentication URL from Slack Teams. Uh, Slack Teams is a package that I helped uh, Yanni CD make. It is on GitHub at, uh, I will put it in the chat. Uh, that. Um, and it's uh, it's all about like dealing with Slack, basically. Um, it's going to generate the URL, you know, that this button is pointing at, which is the authorization URL for uh, Slack's OAuth endpoint. Um, the main thing here is I've got an issue for right now. I just use like all the scopes, and really we shouldn't do that. We should request the scopes that the user actually cares about, and so. Um, that is an issue that I would that I need to do one of the at, at some point. Um, be a little bit more limited in the scopes that we request. Um, scopes are like permissions. What what does this app uh, have permission to do? And right now, um, any app that uses Slack Teams um, is asking for permission to do basically anything in Slack. Um, it's all used internally in R4DS, so it doesn't really matter that much right now, but I could see other use cases uh, not wanting such a wide thing. And so I, I generate that off URL, and then all we do is we have a shiny tag list, and this is again, number 15 is the issue of make this pretty, that it just has uh, the you know login via Slack to access the site and um, a link 
to this uh, SVG or a link to the button, sorry, in Slack button style um, with this uh, SVG is the logo and then the words sign in with Slack. So um, these are uh, like objects that I define elsewhere in the package, dot Slack button style and dot Slack logo SVG. They're not exported, so I have dots on them. Um, and they uh, like just are defining that style info. So does this does the general idea here make sense? So I'm I'm just making a function that returns a um, returns a, a UI, and the reason that it's a function is we need to use this request to figure out where to go to. So if we look at this uh, down at the at the very end it has redirect URI. That is, where am I sending, you know, where do you need to go back to? Um, and in order to know that, I need to get some info from the request because I want to make sure I pass through uh, anything else that they had in the, in the original request. Okay. All right. So the next case is, uh, so now if I click this, we're going to just briefly see the next case. If you watch really close, when I click the allow, it's going to go back to the URL and it's going to have a code equal something that you won't be able to see. And if you pause the video and try to steal that code, it's only valid for uh, a short time. So that code won't do you any good to uh, impersonate me. Um, but it's going to show the code for just a, a second. And that when it shows the code, that is what we're going to generate. So it was there and then it went away. That the um, UI while the code was there is what this parse auth code is generating. And again, that one only shows up when code is in the URL. Um, and so this parse auth code is another internal function that is going to turn, turn that code into a token and then um, actually like save it into a cookie uh, and reload the page. So let's see what this looks like. Um, again, I force all the arguments because it's a function factory. Um, and then I return a function that takes the request. Uh, I need to pass through anything else that's in the request other than code, because that could be you know, other arguments to your Shiny app. It could be things about bookmarking. It could be all kinds of things. It could be which book am I trying to sign up for on the Book Clubber app, for example. Um, and so that's what this update site URL is going to do is remove code, but pass through anything else. So that's the site URL that they're going to go to. And then again, I do another thing from Slack Teams where I ask uh, or I pull out the code and send that to Slack and say, OK, this is the code that I have. This is the redirect URI. Uh, is this valid? Can, can you give me a token, please? And it will either throw an error or return the token. Uh, this number 32, I'm not going to click through on it, but this is just, oh, hey, if it throws an error, it just breaks right now. Um, to a degree, I don't care that much because if this throws an error, someone's probably messing with us. Um, but it would be nice to, to do it a little bit more cleanly. So I'll show that real quick. If I clear out my co cookie and I go over here and say, uh, code is bad. So it throws an error. Um, our log, My log on uh, Shiny Apps right now has a log of what happened, but it's actually a pretty um, hard to follow log, I guess partly because I have verbose equals false there. Um, but we should do something a little bit better, I think. So that's a, a ticket that I have is to deal with that. Um, all right. And then I encrypt the token. Um, I've got a simple little thing that just looks at an environment variable. And if you have it set, it uses that environment variable with the package sodium to encrypt the token. And then I save it. Um, again, this is another cookie function that should be in a cookies package, but right now it's over in scenes. Um, and it's setting the cookie. It's, uh, it's So what it's actually doing is it's, um, and yeah, go ahead and hop off anyone that needs to. I know that I'm running long, uh, but I'm gonna try to finish. Almost done, I think. Uh, yeah, almost done. All right, so it's, it's sending back JavaScript that will set the cookie with the contents that I tell it and the name that I give it and the expiration that I give it. So that's what this set cookie is doing. Um, 
is creating that JavaScript. And then I tell the, uh, I have another piece of JavaScript that tells the page to go to the site URL that I updated that doesn't have the code in it. And so that's where, um, and actually I guess I could do and other r equals whatever. And we'll be able to see that when I sign in and I click allow, it keeps that other arg equals whatever, um, but it got rid of the code uh, when it goes through. So this, this here is what happens after this function, which means that we have the cookie set. Oh yeah, we're at the end. We have the cookie set, everything's right. Now we just show the, UR, the uh, UI. So that's the end. It is exactly one o'clock. We can take a few minutes of, does anyone have any questions uh, that we didn't talk about on the way? Um, and otherwise, please ping me on Slack if you'd like to help, or if you'd like help, if you want to learn more about how some of these things work. I was hoping we'd get a little bit of time to look at scenes a little more, um, but uh, it does look like we will. So um, this took 20 minutes longer than it did when I practiced it. So, all right. Uh, any questions? Um, so is there a technical reason you use function factories over regular functions? So it's, I have to return a function because like if we look at this, I don't know what the code is at this point when I call this function. I am generating the thing that will process the code. And so that's why this is a function factory is I'm generating the function that will later process the code. And the request is what contains the code. Um, did that answer your question, Gus? Um, I'm going to assume so. And uh, okay, yeah, Gus is uh, recovering from vaccination, so uh, he will watch later. Or they'll watch later to see if that covered the or answered the question. Uh, Connor asks, "What other use cases besides R for DS do you see for this package?" So um, we use. Slack at work, and we have uh, some projects that I've done. Um, the projects uh, were before I did this, but I wish that we had had this to tie into um, working with people. Like we could have a dashboard, for example. You could have something that um, in a dashboard that allows them to ask a question that would send it to you in Slack, for example, if you use the login with Slack. Um, I have many cases for, for R4DS that are coming still. So we've got the mentor dashboard for R4DS, um, which you can see at r4ds.io slash, it was already auto filling mentor dash. Uh, this is all of the unanswered questions on uh, R4DS. Oops, I haven't actually logged in. So um, and so, yeah, that this is the questions that are currently in need of being answered. Um, we also have the Book Clubber app that, like I said, most of you have probably seen. And I want to make one that like helps people ask better questions, basically. So you can go to the app and it'll guide you through um, making sure that you have a reprex and uh, or reprex, I guess is how they pronounce that. Um, but yeah, I, anyone who uses Slack, like at a minimum, you can just use it for a login on whatever you have. Uh, as long as you can get the code and get your administrator to install, because uh, you need an app on the other side of it. Um, the This package, actually this, uh, the Slack Teams package has a vignette on adding Slack Teams to your Slack. And um, it used to be hard and now it's relatively easy to create an app because it needs something on the Slack side to talk to. Um, that I, I talk about that a little bit in the r ds or in the R Studio talk. Um, but yeah, you could use it for anyone that has uh, Slack. Anything, anyone that uses Slack, you can use it just for the login. Um, if you have something you want to put behind a login. Scenes, um, I could see more use cases for because um, scenes is where I abstracted out the idea of having different UIs that you show in different cases. And that one, I think, uh, has a lot of 
like, for example, I'm going to make a package for OAuth for Shiny that um, there is one, but it's, I don't like the way they do it. Um, but I'm going to make one that does, uh, and actually, I don't think it's on CRAN anyway, but uh, um, that allows you to make your own OAuth package, like Shiny Slack, for example. Um, you can also, do, there's lots of things that you can do with the queries, so you could have it. Um, it is. So Connor says, scene seems like switch for Shiny UI. Uh, yes. Um, it was first called, uh, at first I called it light switch, um, but it sounded too much like it was on or off. Uh, so it became scenes. Um, but it's, yes, it's a uh, package for choosing different UIs for different, all kinds of different cases. The ones I have implemented right now are those query parameters, cookies. You can also do it um, based on the request method. Um, it could be get or post, or there are a bunch of other um, HTTP methods. Uh, that's, um, I only know of one person who has used posts in uh, Shiny, but you can. Um, I have plans to do some more experiment uh, experimentation with that, but that's a, so that's the thing I deal with, but it also allows you to do things like um, you can change the entire app based on the language of the user, for example. Um, most of the time, you probably wouldn't want to change the whole app, but maybe, I don't know, maybe the app is completely different depending on what language someone speaks or depending on uh, what browser they're using, different things like that. Um, or, you know, theoretically, you could use it for like A-B testing. Um, although I'm not sure exactly what in the request would make sense for that, but um, yeah. Anything else? No, we went a little bit over. Let me see if I missed anything else. Um, I think that's it. Okay. Um, so yeah, next month we will have Connor uh, I don't remember what Connor's going to tell us about, but he's going to tell us about something. <laughs> it's going to be a, an app about uh, exploring census data. Oh, cool. All right. And, and I just now thought of a use case for scenes in that app. So <laughs> Awesome. Well, that one I plan to get up onto CRAN pretty soon. Uh, Shiny Slack right now uses Slack teams and getting Slack teams on the CRAN is going to be a pretty heavy lift um, because Slack teams has a whole, like there's a whole universe of Slack related packages that uh, Yanni put together. And right now the way they test, like they trigger tests in one another and there's this complicated stuff that uh, it's like too complicated to go to CRAN right now. Um, but we have talked about doing the effort to get Slack teams up on CRAN. And then after that, putting Shiny Slack up on CRAN. Um, but yeah, Scenes uh, doesn't have a lot of dependencies. I guess the first thing, the thing I need to do before Scenes will go to CRAN is pull all the cookie stuff out. It belongs in its own package. And so I'll probably get that package up on CRAN and then uh, Scenes will be on CRAN. Um, and the reason to do that is I don't want to have these exported functions and scenes that I then remove. Um, once it's on CRAN, like I want it to be anything I export, I want to stand by basically. And right now, scenes is exporting a bunch of cookie related functions that it has no business having anything to do with. Um, some of them it doesn't use at all. And then, but the reason I put them all there is it had some cookie things that it did use. And so uh, I wanted one place to pull them from. Um, all right. Anything else before I click the button? Uh, again, this is at rfds.io slash proj0101. And I will see you all on Slack. Thanks, John. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.